And tonight's lesson, part one of this series, is the framework of the gospel. The framework of the gospel. Amen. Let us have prayer. And I, I ask that you pray for yourself as I pray that your heart would be represented by that good and rich soil so that you can receive the word of God and bear fruit. Let us pray together this evening. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, that it is the Sabbath day. We thank you for these summer days where the Sabbath is very long and extended. We have a lot of opportunity to fellowship with one another and even more so to commune with you. Lord, help us to realize that in communing with you, we behold your glory. And if we so will, are changed into your image, even as by the spirit of the Lord. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Father, we confess unto you that there is nothing that we need more than to be liberated from the powers of sin through your Holy Ghost. And we ask that you would change us from glory to glory. I ask that you would give each one of us a heart of humility, that no matter how we have tasted of your glory, and ask that our hearts would hunger and thirst after righteousness for an ever, even greater beholding of your glory. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that this moment right here would prepare us for that moment when it is spoken of in Revelation 22 and verse 4, they shall see your face and your name shall be on our foreheads. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. The framework of the gospel. Amen. I do not want to undersell the importance of what we're studying. Um, yes, is, is somebody asking something? Can we please have you mute your phones when you're not speaking so that it is not interrupting? Thank you oh, so much. Thank amen. you so and much. And I, I am covenanting uh, that we will, uh, we will move through this material in a timely manner, and we will have a period, each session that we do of this, we will have a period for questions and answers. So I'm asking you, uh, because we are here to teach tonight, we are here to teach and to learn and to educate, um, write down questions. If you hear something, write down questions, write down observations and comments, because we do not want to miss them, uh, but we will have a time for that at the end want to undersell the importance of this subject that we are covering. Uh, God is using this very teaching in my life, and I see him in the lives of others like Sister Marable and those who participate in our prayer call. Um, he is using this subject and understanding, a practical understanding of this subject to prepare us for feeling time and that we may be those who are fitted up to be used to give his loud cry. That should excite your heart and give you enthusiasm that God wants to do that through you. And I promise if you will so have it, uh, that is the power of this teaching and the importance of this teaching uh, for us. So we want to jump right in the framework of the gospel. Amen. Uh, and I have, I have it on my screen here. Handout has the answers. If you do happen to get that handout, you'll be able to fill in. And I'm sure if not tonight, these handouts will be gotten to you so that you can have this to study up on. I want to talk to you tonight. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to study. So we're going to go deep, but if you trust in the Holy Ghost, he can expand our minds to grasp what is learned. Uh, I want to tell you about the ellipse of truth, the ellipse of truth. Now, what is that? Well, Psalm 19 and verse one says this, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. We know that nature reveals the character and the ways of God, uh, that scripture is the first book through whom uh, we receive a knowledge of God, our savior, but that nature is his second book that we are to learn of the creator through his creation. Uh, here is one observation from nature, from the creation that I want to bring out that is very important, the planets orbit the sun. In our solar system, the planets orbit the sun in an elliptical, not a circular motion. Now, why is this important? Because uh, I know many of you have studied this teaching, but as we go through this teaching, we're not just going to be adding uh, new points of information. Uh, the goal is that we're going to start uh, to, 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 to lay a foundation. In this first session, we really need to lay a doctrinal foundation uh, not just the, the facts that you know about the investigative judgment, 
but the way you think about it, okay? We're not just telling you what to understand, but I really want the Holy Ghost to shape how you're understanding this so it can impress your heart the right way. The planets orbit the sun in an elliptical, not a circular motion, okay? When you look at a circle, a circle has one central focus, okay? A circle, uh, the center is equidistant from all points at the sides. It has one central focus. An ellipse, on the other hand, has two balanced foci. In other words, when you have an ellipse, it's an oblong shape, and, and, the, and, and it has two points of focus. This is important because I want you to see tonight that truth is elliptical, not circular, okay? Truth is elliptical, not circular. What, what do I mean here? Uh, truth always, truth always has two aspects that must be held in perfect tension. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to understand this. This is where many other Christians struggle. Uh, this keeps them from seeing the truth for this time. Uh, a lot of people think of everything as having a singular focus. For example, I put some examples here of how truth always has two aspects that must be held in perfect tension. So I want you to start envisioning truth as an ellipse, not as a circle, okay? As an ellipse. For example, a lot of Christians love to focus on God's grace. And, and we wanna say that God's grace is central to all of our understanding of scripture. It's central to the gospel. Uh, but in reality, when you look at scripture, uh, the truth of God's grace must be held in perfect tension with his law, okay? As Seventh-day Adventists, we grasp that, that you have these two equally vital truths that if we have a correct understanding of the word and a correct appreciation of God's character and a correct experience and a balanced Christian character, we hold the points of God's grace and God's law in perfect tension because that's the way the Bible presents it to us. Another example is how God's mercy must be held in perfect tension with his justice. Okay? We also see that God's sovereignty, and that's a big word, God's sovereignty means his, his rulership, his absolute authority over all things, must be held in perfect tension with human responsibility, okay? It is true that God is in control of every aspect and situation and event and happening of his universe, but that does not negate the reality that he has given us a responsibility in how we relate ourselves to him. Right, Some Christians go as far as to believe that uh, people don't even have a choice in salvation, that God chooses who will be saved and who will be lost, right? Because they, they only want to focus on God's sovereignty. Uh, in order to really grasp the importance of this truth, the investigative judgment, must understand that truth be held in God's sovereignty, must be held in perfect tension with human responsibility. Uh, when it comes to our life and our response to the gospel, the truths of the truth of faith must be held in perfect tension with the truth of obedience. It is necessary that we have faith in Jesus Christ, for that is how we are saved. But it is also necessary that our faith is manifest in obedience. And, and, and we're going to see all of these unpacked very clearly tonight. Uh, we also see that the, the truth the truths of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection must be held in perfect tension with his work as high priest and heavenly judge. In other words, uh, Jesus's earthly ministry, the importance of his ministry on earth, must be held in perfect tension with his work as high priest and heavenly judge, okay? Let me show you a few examples of this in scripture. Uh, scripture, we see this in John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, okay? In Jesus Christ, the word who became flesh, we saw his glory. He is the revelation of God's character to us. It says, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, and God's character revealed in Jesus, God's glory was full of what? Full of grace and truth, okay? God's mercy and God's justice, God's and his truth 
are perfectly revealed in Jesus. Jesus reveals this perfect balance of truth in his life. We see the same principle revealed in God's revelation of himself to Moses in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, and he begins to list his attributes, his character. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. So you see all of these words, all of these descriptors that unfold to us God's mercy, his love, his grace, but it is balanced by this statement, what? Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So in God, Amen. we see this balance of truth and we must learn if you're going to know the present truth and if, if it's actually going to take a root in your heart and life you must learn how to hold truths in perfect balance as a matter of fact that's part of the glory and the weight of truth is that you see things that the human mind at times has a hard time resolving but you know that god is just so big and so amazing that we're never going to completely pin him down, okay? We're never going to completely grasp him as in to fully explain him away. You can't. And that's what makes it so amazing as we behold this ellipse of truth. And we behold this in nature by looking at the orbit of the planets in our solar system around the sun. They are held in balance. They are kept in their path on an elliptical motion, not a circular motion, okay? Which leads to this, to this uh, point we want to make here. Are we justified by faith or by works? The answer is yes. That may surprise you. Are we justified by faith or by works? Yes. These are two things that we're going to have to hold in tension. Now, bear with me. I know this is not the normal presentation. You're thinking, okay, we're getting into the investigative judgment. I'm ready to get into Daniel. I'm ready to get into Leviticus. I'm ready to dig into Hebrew. So, so where are these texts? Like I said, we are uh, taking a deeper dive into this subject than maybe you have gone before. So, so, so come to this with an open mind. Are we justified by faith or by works? Yes. For example, uh, look at how Paul explains the situation in Romans chapter 2 verses 13 to 16. Romans chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. What does he say? He says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be what? Justified. Here he makes it clear that those who do the law, not those who hear, not those who claim, but those who do the law will be justified. The context explains to us, as you move down to verse 16, I've kind of truncated some things for the sake of it, that this will happen, what? On the day when, according to my gospel, God will do what? Judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. This is important. Paul is saying here that when God judges, it's the doers of the law who will be found just. Hold that in your mind. Because I want you to see this. A lot of times we think, oh, Paul says justified by faith, and we jump over to James, and James says justified by works. But I want to show you, in the very same letter of Romans, Paul himself says the doers of the law are justified, and he turns back around later in chapter 3, verses 24 to 28, he says this very clearly, being justified, what, as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, and he explains further in verse 28, for we maintain that a man is just how faith of works of the law. Now on the surface, it's like, wait a minute, Paul, you just said the doer of the law will be justified. And now you yourself are turning around saying that we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. But we come to the Bible with this fundamental assumption that God is not the author of confusion. One man inspired by the Holy Spirit is not going to contradict himself. It, it, none of the Bible contradicts itself, especially 
Paul, in the process of writing one letter, he's not going to contradict himself. What, what, is, what is the balance that we have to see here to understand really what is going on in this investigative judgment that we take part in? Here's what you must understand. The word justification can be used in two different senses. To justify can mean to forgive or to vindicate, okay? Uh, when you begin to read anything, really, but especially the Bible, you will notice that words can be used having different meanings at different times, okay? We see this all the time in our life. For example, just think of a simple word like the word one, okay? One can represent the number one. Uh, one can represent a single unit or entity. Uh, you can have people that are lined up in a contest, and you can say, this gentleman is number one to signify he is the best or he's in first place. Or just like you were talking about in a marriage seminar, you talked about how the two must become one, okay? Or you can say that the church should move together and Jesus prayed that his church would be one, meaning that in a marriage, the man and wife are to be unified or that the church is to be unified. So a word as simple as the number one, you can use it in so many different contexts. That applies to just about every word. Every word has a range of meanings and the only way you understand it is by reading carefully what the author says to catch what is the point that he's making. So when you read this word justification in the Bible, you begin to realize that the word justification can be used in two different senses. To justify or to be justified can mean to forgive or to vindicate. When we say that we're justified by God, it can mean in some contexts, in some contexts, excuse me, that we are forgiven. It can mean in other contexts that we will be vindicated. Let me explain. What is forgiveness? How do we understand forgiveness? Well, I took these definitions from the Webster's Dictionary 1828. Uh, forgiveness, the act of forgetting, of forgiving, excuse me, the pardon of an offender by what he is considered and treated as not guilty. The forgiveness of enemies is a Christian duty. Okay, here's another definition of forgiveness, the pardon or remission of an offense or crime as the forgiveness of sin or of injuries. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, most Christians recognize this meaning of the word justification. Like, for example, let's go back up to here, Romans chapter 3. We see, let's, let's substitute the word forgiven here for justified. Being forgiven as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, for we maintain that a man is forgiven by faith apart from works of the law. And that makes sense. We are pardoned for our crimes and our offenses against God uh, as a gift through his grace. And it's only by trusting in him, by having faith in him, that this happens for us, okay? So that makes sense. The problem is that many people stop there. They stop there, and then they like to dismiss other texts like this when the Bible says the doers of the law will be justified, they like to belittle it or dismiss it or not talk about it. But brothers and sisters, man lives by every word from the mouth of God. You should never get to a text of the Bible that you're afraid of, that you want to dismiss, explain away. You should, you should be confident that you can rightly understand every text that is in God's word because the things which are revealed are for us and for our children that we may do his law, okay? So forgiveness is one meaning of Amen. justification. Forgiveness is one meaning, but let's go further. What's the other word I brought up? Another meaning of justification is this very important word, vindication. Now, we use the word forgiveness pretty much, pretty often in our modern context. Vindication is not a word that we talk about so much. So this word is less familiar, and I believe sometimes why we don't understand this important biblical concept of vindication and the importance of it, okay? So what is vindication? The defense of anything or a what? This is from the dictionary. Or a what? A justification against denial or censure or against objections or accusations. Now, all these words, if you're thinking in a Bible context, some of these words should just be causing thoughts to spring out of your mind like, oh, to be justified against a denial or against an accusation. Okay, or look at, look at number two, vindication. What does it mean? The act of supporting by proof or a legal process, the proving of anything to be what? Just, 
as the vindication of a title or claim or right. Now, think about that. God is presenting his people, his redeemed people, as having a claim or right to his eternal kingdom. He wants to prove that we are just. He wants to support by proof in a legal process a judgment that his people are indeed just. Now, let's take that word vindication and let's put it back in this text we read from 2. It is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be what? Vindicated. Vindicated. They will be proven to be righteous. So you see, there is no disagreement when Paul says what he says. He is saying that those who have actually become obedient to God's law, and I'll take this time to say that the only kind of obedience the Bible recognizes is perfect obedience, right? We know that. What does James chapter 2, verse 10 say? If you keep the whole law, yet you offend in one point, you're guilty of what? You're guilty of all. So the only way to obey uh, God's commandments is to obey them perfectly. There, there is no other way. If you're not obeying God's commandments perfectly, you're not obeying God's commandments. That might make you tremble. That might make you shudder. Amen. It should. It should. It should help us to realize how serious, how serious is our need. Because either you're obeying God's commandments perfectly or you're not at all, right? And, 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 and Paul says here, the, the doers of the law, those who are obedient to the, the law of God will be proven to be just. They will be proven through legal process to have a claim to the kingdom of heaven. When on the day, when my gospel will do what he will judge the secrets of men. So we see that, oh, this makes sense. Both of these statements make perfect sense when you understand how the word justified is being used. So again, I ask you, are we justified by faith or by works? Yes. The answer is yes. And when rightly understood, this is gospel truth. When rightly understood, that's good news, my brothers. Let me uh, show this to you. Um, these are two points. That's why I introduced you to that idea that truth is elliptical. Truth is balanced. Truth does not just focus on a singular focus, but truth always holds two points in perfect tension. These are the two points that must be held in perfect tension in the truth of justification, that we're justified by faith, but we're also justified by works. The Bible presents both of these, and they're held in perfect tension. Uh, the reformer Martin Luther said it this way, and I'm bringing Martin Luther into our conversation to show you that this is not a new concept. This is not something that Seventh-day Adventists invented. This is something that God resurrected that was buried under centuries of papal error that God resurrected and has committed to our trust. Amen? He's committed this to our trust. This is Martin Luther. He says, we are saved by faith alone. The faith that saves never alone. Ponder that. That's a very, a very elegant way to express that we are saved faith alone, the faith is never alone. Uh, right here, I wrote, it, I wrote it here too. Here it is. In Jesus, we are justified, that is forgiven of our sins by faith. In judgment, we will be justified, that is vindicated or proven to be righteous before God by works, okay? Now, I do want to ask, before I move on, just can you indicate for me that, that that is making sense. That's the disadvantage of not being in a live audience. Is that point making sense? Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. That, that has to make sense to you that while we are justified, the forgiveness and compassion to God comes to us only through faith, our claim to an inheritance in the kingdom of God will be vindicated or proven to be true because of works. Let's unpack this more. This brings us right into the judgment hour message, okay? Let's take some time and unpack the seventh day Adventist message. Remember, tonight we're laying a doctrinal foundation. I promise, I promise. This thing is going to get so practical, maybe so intensely practical that it's going to make us uncomfortable, but I praise God we need to be made uncomfortable because Laodicea, Laodicea is condemned for her comfort. 
Amen. Amen. We got to lay this doctrinal foundation. Let's lay it. We're going to Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Um, a scripture I believe is familiar to many of us. And if it's not, amen. This study is for everybody. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. All right? That's our focus right now. The everlasting gospel in the hour of his judgment. Let's finish reading through these messages. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So what do we see here? This passage is known to us as the three angels' messages. We see here the everlasting gospel going to all the world in the hour of God's judgment. In the hour of God's judgment, we see uh, three angels commissioned to give three messages, and we see the final words are a declaration of God's people who endure or who are patient. That's what the biblical word patience means, who endure. It says they kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So let's unpack this. This is important. Rightly understood, this is going to shape the way you do everything in your life. This is going to shape the way, even in your home, your marriage, your parenting, your relationships among siblings and among extended family members. If we understand what is being said here, it should shape everything. Let's, let me go ahead and explain. All right, so here's what I want you to understand here. The content, okay? The content of the Seventh-day Adventist message is the everlasting gospel. That's the content of our message. The context of the seventh day adventist message is the hour of god's judgment okay i want that's that's one of the nuggets that you that you probably want to take from this study the content of the seventh day adventist message is the everlasting gospel don't let anybody deceive you seventh day adventists are called in this world to preach the gospel the seventh day adventist church needs to be here because there is not another church on this earth preaching the gospel do you hear me Mercy. There is not another church on this earth that preaches the gospel. There may be some who in their get this part or that part right, and I praise God for them, but there is only one church on this earth who preaches the entirety of the gospel message, and the Seventh-day Adventist church is it. I'm not here to defend that claim tonight, but I will make that claim. The reason I used to be a Baptist and now I'm a Seventh-day Adventist is because through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit of God, I realized the Baptists preach a false gospel, a gospel that would condemn my soul if I remained in it, and that the everlasting gospel is going to all the earth through God's faithful servants, represented by these angels. An angel is a messenger, okay? Represented by these angels. And when I heard the true gospel, I praise God, it became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. And I pray that that same experience has happened for you, is renewed for you, or will happen for you. Let's, 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 let's move on. Here is something. Here is a mission statement of the Adventist church, okay, taken directly from the three angels' messages. 
Seventh-day Adventists have been called to preach the unchanging good news about God with the threefold emphasis of worship, wisdom, and warning to prepare a people who will maintain unbroken loyalty to God during the time of the investigative judgment. Okay? That is a synopsis of everything that is contained in the three angels' messages. We need to understand the weight, the importance of that phrase, everlasting gospel. Everlasting gospel. In other words, gospel is eternal or everlasting because it comes from what is eternal and everlasting. One of the attributes that is directly connected to God's eternality is his unchangeableness, right? God is introduced to us in the book of Revelation as he who was, who is, and who is to come. That title of God points us back to the book of Exodus when Moses asked God, what if the people ask me what your name is? What shall I tell them? God told Moses what? You shall tell them that I am has sent you. The name I am is so important. In the Hebrew, it's literally the verb hayah, which literally means to be. And as a matter of fact, God's covenant name, Yahweh, is one way we pronounce it. Yahweh is nothing more than a conjugation of the verb to be. Now, what is the importance of God giving himself this name, Yahweh, or I am? What is the importance? God is literally telling us that he is the unchanging one, okay? Uh, it, it, think of it this way. If you are eternal, by definition, you have to be unchanging. I just want you to chew on that. That's that, I won't unpack that philosophically for you right now. But if something is indeed eternal, that means it's unchanging. And that's what the name I am means, okay? In the Hebrew language, uh, you realize that the verb to be has no tense. It has no reference to past, present, or future. So it can be translated variously according to context. Why is that important? Because when God introduces his name to Moses and says, I am that I am, tell them that I am has sent you. What God is literally saying, I am that I am. You could literally translate that phrase, I am what I was. I was what I am. I am what I will be. I will be what I was, and I was what I will be. In other words, God was saying, I don't change. I do not change. And that's why you see so many applications in Scripture that the Lord changes not. Jesus Christ, the same, what? Yesterday, today, and forevermore. The Father of lights with whom is no variableness or shadow of changing. There's not the slightest chance or possibility. God does not change because his eternality is directly connected with his unchangeableness. It's directly connected with his perfection. Okay, that's what it means to be perfect, to have no need of alteration or improvement or change. And in that sense, only God is absolutely perfect. Only God is without the possibility of advancement, alteration, change, or growth, because he is absolutely perfect, okay? Okay? This is what we need to understand about the everlasting gospel. The gospel has changed from God's first definition in the Garden of Eden, that the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent, until the very last pronouncement of the gospel, that we shall see his face and his name shall be on our foreheads. The, the gospel does not change. Amen. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have had committed to our trust the gospel that has been with God's prophets and apostles since the very beginning of time. Seventh-day Adventists are not preaching new truth. We're preaching old truth that was forgotten, okay? That's why the Bible talks about the dark ages. That's why it was prophesied that at the time of the end, many should run to and fro and knowledge should increase. Okay. So we preach the unchanging good news about God, right? Paul affirms for us that, that, that there is no other gospel. The gospel does not change. Galatians chapter one, verses six through nine. What does Paul say about this? He says, I am amazed talking to the church at Galatia, talking to us today. You should be amazed just like Paul. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. OK, there is no other gospel. There are many distortions of the gospel or perversions of the gospel, but there is no other gospel. 
Amen. Paul says here, but if we, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Let me say, if somebody preaches a gospel to you contrary to what is written in this holy word, let them be accursed. In other words, let God take care of that person. That's what the word accursed means in the Greek anathema. When a person preaches a different gospel, when they pervert or distort the gospel, they bring themselves under the curse of God. And Paul says, you just let them stay there. Okay, verse nine, he repeats himself. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man, any pastor, any elder, any conference president, any relative, any theologian or biblical scholar at one of our institutions, any conference official or administrator, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. He is under the judgment of God and you just need to leave him there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what the word of God is saying tonight? And I am emphasizing this because I am so upset I will use that word. My brother brought out that text from Ephesians, be angry and sin not. I am upset when I hear Seventh-day Adventists running scared, okay? We let people from other churches convince us that we don't know the gospel. How? I don't understand. Here's what I feel like sometimes. I feel like I'm walking out of Babylon and I have my eyes set on the holy city, Jerusalem. And as I'm on the way out of Babylon to Jerusalem, I meet some people from the city of Jerusalem who are all gung-ho and excited, walking the opposite direction, telling me they're on the way to Babylon. Mercy. And I'm like, where are you going? And why are you so excited to leave? And why are you so excited? I just came from there. Trust me, it's a lie. It's not what you think it is. In other words, why are we so easily knocked off of our platform? How can you let a man, or a woman for that matter, how can you let a person who cannot discern the difference between one and seven tell you you don't know the gospel? And so I'm saying this, that you need to understand. The Seventh-day Adventists, we're preaching the gospel. These other churches, even in all their sincerity, they're not preaching the gospel. At best, they get some parts of it right, and it's beautiful when they do. Amen? They're not preaching the gospel. Amen. Because here's the reality. I'll say it like this. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the everlasting gospel, does not exempt us from judgment. You tell me. Use your brain. Which is better? There's one gospel that says, oh, I'm saved. I'm exempt from the judgment of God. Now, the everlasting gospel says, no, 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 no. The gospel enables you to stand in judgment, right? Amen. That's the way that Jude says it. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Okay, you just tell me, use your sense. Which one sounds better? The gospel that says, oh, you're exempt from judgment, or the gospel that says, by the grace of Christ, you'll be enabled to stand before God in judgment. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, you can apply, this is one of those great cases uh, where you can apply Pascal's wager. I don't know if you're familiar with Pascal's wager. It goes something like this. Okay, let's, let's take the, 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 the typical evangelical Christian and, and the Adventist. The evangelical Christian says, hey, I'm saved. I'm exempt from judgment. The Adventist says, well, uh, I'm trusting in God's grace to be prepared to stand in judgment. What's better? You think of it. This is Pascal's wager. If, okay, if the evangelical is right, then it's still okay. Because that just means they live the holy consecrated life. You understand what I'm saying? But they're both trusting in the Lord. If the evangelical is, is, is all right. That, if the evangelical is right, the Adventist is okay. But think about this. What if the Adventist is right? What does that say about that person who says, well, I'm not going to stand in judgment. It doesn't matter whether I obey God's commands or not, because I'm saved. That's Pascal's wager. It's like, are you really willing to, to risk your life on that? Because like, wait a second, if the Adventists are right and the gospel 
is to so transform me into God's image that I can stand before the presence of his glory without fall, then everybody who's walking around here talking about I'm saved and doesn't matter what I do, they're going to be in big trouble come judgment day. And we know they are. Jesus told us they are. He's going to say to them, what? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Amen. I never knew you. So this is important. Don't let anybody tell you. Now, moving on here, uh, let's, let's kind of unpack this. Let's unpack this. Let's unpack these three messages. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through this at lightning speed. That's why I'm, I want you to have it. So you can take time to go through this, okay? I said that we are commissioned to preach the unchanging good news. We're commissioned to preach the everlasting gospel in the hour of God's judgment. Or I like to say it like this. The three angels' messages are a threefold emphasis of the everlasting gospel, okay? It's a threefold emphasis. In other words, we're still preaching the gospel, but in the last days, what makes it present truth is what we emphasize about it, okay? And as I go through this, you're probably going to immediately start thinking, man, I've heard a lot of teachings and a lot of sermons. They might be saying some good things about the gospel, but they're not emphasizing the right points. So you don't take it from me. Take it from, take it from God's word. All right. The first angel's message emphasizes worship, okay? That's the first angel's message. It emphasizes worship. Or in other words, the first angel's message emphasizes the effects of the everlasting gospel. What is the result of the gospel in a person's life? In other words, the first angel's message tells us if you are saved, as you claim to be, you will respect God. That's why it says fear God. If you are saved, you will respect God. If you are saved, you will reflect God. That's why it says, give glory to him. And that phrase, give glory to him, is so important. And I know that not long ago, Elder Larry was just unpacking a, a lot of these messages. So I'm, I'm not going intensively deep into each of these points. But that phrase, give glory to him, is especially important in terms of our place in our Christian home. Are you reflecting the character of God? in the home. That's really what it comes down to. Are we reflecting the image of the lovely Jesus fully? That's what the word glory means in Greek. It literally means to reflect, to shine brilliantly. Okay. And that's why Paul says what he says, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. He says, whether you eat, whether you drink and whatsoever you do, every aspect of life do so to the glory of God. God is bringing us to the point, if we so will, where through every facet of life, down to the very routines, down to the very habitual routines of our life, we're going to be a reflection of God's image. Can you say amen to that? That's good news. Amen. That's amen. good news. Um, and, and, and yeah, like, come on, come on. You know, when you read the Bible, you know that Paul was a Seventh-day Adventist. But let's keep moving. Um, if you are saved, you will respect God. If you're saved, you will reflect God. And guess what? If you are saved, you will remember God. That's why the Sabbath is the testing message. Uh, that is, if you are saved, you will obey all of God's commandments of which the Sabbath is the sign, pointing back to God as our creator. These, this, is, this is the truth that is contained in that first angel's message. It emphasizes true worship. True worship is the result of a saving experience with Christ. We fear God. We give glory to him and we remember him as creator, namely symbolized in our keeping of the Sabbath. Okay. Of course, more I could say about that, but let's keep moving. The second angel's message emphasizes wisdom. Okay. Remember, it's a threefold emphasis to the gospel. Because a lot of people ask, like, wait a second. If Revelation 14, 6 to 12 is about the gospel. Why does it say so little about Jesus? Why does it say so little about the cross? Why doesn't it say anything about grace? It's because right now in the time we're living in, what needs to be emphasized is what is said in these messages. The second angel's messages emphasizes wisdom. That is discernment to embrace truth and reject falsehood. Okay? Wisdom. That's why it tells us that Babylon is fallen. And did you notice the repetition? Babylon is fallen once, is fallen twice. Okay, here's a great representation of that. Here's one of those nuggets that I put in here for you to follow up on uh, at your own convenience. Okay, this is a study that I, that I love that I remember when God showed it to me, the two falls of Babylon. 
Babylon has fallen, has fallen, fallen once. Okay? Consider Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar's pride that led to his fall. That story is told in Daniel chapter 4, okay? This foreshadowed the pride that Babylon displayed in substituting Sunday for God's seventh-day Sabbath, okay? I, I put it in there in nugget form, but I, I, I encourage you to go unpack that, okay? Consider the lip of Babylon, how he fell through pride, and consider how that is reflected in the pride of prophetic Babylon. The first fall of Babylon is pride. And guess what, brothers and sisters? If we are a Seventh-day Adventist in name, we still need to depart from Babylon in terms of letting God cleanse us from every vestige of pride in our life. We must overcome every besetment, pride, love of the world. And, I, and, and, and brothers and sisters, you should never be willing to say that I have no pride. If you understand how insidious and how... Uh, pastor, I'm our sorry. Nature, pastor, pride is. Yes. Pastor, I, I am hearing terrible feedback. Is anyone else hearing that? Yeah, we are feeding back a little bit. We are feeding back. Uh, so just make sure we're on mute here. Yes, we are. Yes. Can the can the keep uh, can the host just go ahead and mute everyone except for Sister uh, Pastor Burrell, please? Yes. Do I have that? Do I have that power or no? Oh, not the host. No, you don't, the Pastor. Host. It's going to be the host has to do that. Okay, I'll give you a second to do that. Amen? Amen. Okay. So uh, the second angel's message emphasizes wisdom, and we need to have the wisdom or the discernment to reject the pride of Babylon in all of its forms. That's just the main form is how prophetic Babylon displayed this pride in substituting Sunday for God's seventh-day Sabbath. Okay? Consider that. Very important. Um, the second fall of Babylon, consider Belshazzar's presumption. Okay, so the second fall of Babylon is presumption. What are the falls of Babylon? Babylon's pride, Babylon's presumption, and just because we are Seventh-day Adventists in name, we must be cleansed of these as well. This is pivotal to us being Christians in the home. Don't worry, we're going to be practically unpacking that. We're just laying the foundation tonight. Um, Babylon is fallen, okay? Uh, Belshazzar's presumption led to Babylon's final fall. We read that story in Daniel chapter 5. This foreshadowed how Babylon, now I'm going to say this, this might spark some interest. I'm not going to unpack it, but it's very deep. This foreshadowed how Babylon would introduce the error of spiritualism into the church through the false doctrine of the immortality of the soul. This false doctrine essentially teaches that a person can live in sin without consequence and become a God to themselves. Cross reference that with Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent told Eve, you will not surely die and you shall be as gods. That's the foundations of spiritualism. And spiritualism, trust me, brothers and sisters, it's not about ghosts and seances and Ouija boards. It's really about presumption, you thinking you can live in sin without consequence. If you, it, 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 while we are living in willful, known and cherished sin, we're the biggest, the biggest spiritualists there are out there. Okay? Don't, don't just think that it's the magic eight balls and and the witches, that's a part of spiritualism. But remember, Sister White tells us that there is a spiritualism that is much more attractive to the Christian world and the educated world. And that spiritualism is the thought that I can live in sin and still enjoy the favor of God, okay? Amen. So, so Amen. those are the two falls of Babylon that you see directly in the book of Daniel, Babylon's pride and Babylon's presumption. The second angel's message calls us to have the wisdom to reject her pride, and her presumption in all of its forms and to embrace God's truth, okay? And finally, the third angel's message emphasizes warning, okay? So what are the three emphasis of the three angels' messages? Worship, true worship, wisdom, and warning. Simply stated, if your claim to salvation is not validated by obedience to God's commandments and you embrace the falsehoods of Babylon, you will be deceived by the mark of the beast and will be destroyed by fire and brimstone in God's judgment. I should have said God's judgment. I repeated myself by accident. But that, that's just the simplicity of it. God is giving this final warning, okay? If you claim to be saved, but there's no real obedience and you're still embracing these falsehoods of Babylon in their multiplicitous forms, you will be deceived by this final crisis. 
and you will drink of the wrath of God. Amen? Amen. And that message, that message is so heartbreaking because the cup, the wine of the wrath of God poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. That's the very cup that was trembling in the hands of Christ in the garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And Christ, in his immense struggle to the point of sweating great drops of blood, he said yes to drink that cup for you and me. The fact that there is anyone who will drink of that cup is a mystery beyond contemplation. When Christ has drained that cup to its dregs out of love for us, the thought that we would reject him because of our pride, our presumption, our love of sin in this world. There is no good explanation for sin. To explain it is to excuse it. That's why it's called the mystery of lawlessness. And God in his love warns us that if we reject Jesus and his truth and its sanctifying power in our lives, we will be judged. We will be condemned, okay? So finally, the effect of this message is that God will have a people who maintain their loyalty to him and his truth. That's what is meant by the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is what enables them to endure. What enables the people of God to endure to the end is their loyalty to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And notice, I believe, I believe that's what Sister White is talking about here. Um, this is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. Um, it didn't record the page number for me. I believe it's page 68. Forgive me. Forgive me. It, it, it put my reference, but it didn't give me, give me the page. I believe that's what G, uh, Sister White is talking about here in her first vision when she says, Jesus raised his mighty glorious arm, laid hold of the pearly gate, swung it back on its glittering hinges, and said to us, what? You have washed your robes in my blood. In other words, you've become obedient to God's commandments through faith in me, because you've been cleansed from your sins in my blood. You have washed your robes in my blood and what stood stiffly for my truth. In other words, you stood boldly and uncompromisingly for the faith of Jesus. That means the faith that Jesus taught and exemplified in his life and passed on to his apostles. Amen. Um, that is the effect of this message. That's the message. And the good news is that it's all about Jesus. Okay. Don't let anybody tell you that that the investigative judgment is not about Christ. It's all about Jesus, okay? Why? Because are, are you seeing it? Okay, so, so let me, if I haven't made myself clear, started off tonight by explaining that truth always contains two points that must be held in perfect tension. The first point that must be held in perfect tension is that we are justified in the sense of forgiveness by faith, but we will, be we will be justified in the sense of vindicated or proven to be righteous by works, okay? Hold those two points in perfect tension. Rightly understood, there's no disagreement. That rolls into what? The second two points that must be held in perfect balance are the content of our message, the everlasting gospel, and the context of our message, the hour of God's judgment. That's how we know that as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it must be given this distinct emphasis. Or in other words, we give the trumpet that certain sound of bringing out that emphasis given in the three angels' messages, okay? These are what we're holding in perfect tension. Let's see, what are the next two things that we hold in tension? Well, you must hold in tension the earthly ministry of Jesus. I already mentioned his life, death, and resurrection. Notice this is what the majority of Christianity, this is pretty much all they acknowledge about Jesus. In all their sermons, this is all you hear about. Brothers and sisters, if we are Seventh-day Adventists and, and you have a pastor or listening, you're listening to the preachers and this is all they ever talk about is the earthly ministry of Jesus, there is something terribly wrong, okay? Amen. This Amen. is important truth. This, but it must be held in balance. Okay, now we go to one of our founding prophecies. We see a full explanation, a full prediction of the earthly ministry of Jesus in Daniel chapter 9, okay? It, uh, when the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, 70 weeks are determined for you, for your people and for your holy city. Now, I'm not breaking down the timing of the 70 weeks right now, but in this prophecy, you see a full explanation of Jesus's earthly ministry. Here's another 
a point of information that you can follow up on. And I, and I enumerated it in the text. Seven weeks are determined for your people for the Holy City to do what? To finish transgression. And I gave these New Testament references to show how these were fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 uh, verse 26 says that Jesus came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, uh, to make an end of sins, right? Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Um, to make reconciliation for iniquity, uh, Jesus has made peace through the blood of his cross. So I encourage you, follow up. Do some homework. This is a good study. This is good material for, for morning devotion to meditate on how Jesus, just exactly how Jesus fulfilled uh, these prophetic predictions in his earthly ministry. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He brought in everlasting righteousness, okay, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up or to fulfill vision and prophecy, right? Didn't Jesus, when he was on earth, he preached saying the time is fulfilled. He fulfilled vision and prophecy and also to anoint the most holy. And we know that Jesus was the mess Messiah or the Mashiach, the anointed one. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was anointed to carry out God's mission of salvation. Okay. So, so, so th this is the framework of the gospel that I'm talking about. As Seventh-day Adventists, we must live and operate. I'm talking, I mean, in your marriage, young people, as you go to school and prepare for usefulness in this life, you must live and operate within this prophetic framework. This prophetic framework of the gospel is not just good for explaining our theology. This is good for life. Everything about your life can be properly understood within this prophetic framework. As a matter of fact, in worship this morning, I was reading to my son the story. Uh, you guys know the story about Jesus's uh, first Passover when they left him in the temple, right? And they found him three days later uh, talking to the scribes in the face. And I explained to my son how Jesus discovered his life's mission in the sanctuary, okay? And I was explaining to my son that he's going to discover the purpose for his life and existence by studying the sanctuary salvation message of God. And Amen. that's true for all of us, okay? Especially as Seventh-day Adventists, you will not, you really can't understand the importance of your familial relationships until you understand the prophetic framework that we live in. And, and this is on the front side. Daniel chapter nine is on the front side of the prophetic framework of the gospel that should shape our life. We live in light of Jesus having come to earth and having accomplished these things. This should affect, this, brothers and sisters, this should affect the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we resolve conflicts. Amen. This truth is practical but we have to allow it to be so. And you know the rest of the prophecy, it explains the breakdown of those 70 weeks. That's not my purpose here, but I left it in the handout for you to follow up on. This is the, the first, this is on the backside of the prophetic framework. And it pointed us forward, what? What are, what are the two points that we're holding in tension? The earthly ministry of Jesus and also what? The heavenly ministry of Jesus. See, we accept the everlasting gospel. We accept the entire thing. The problem with our, our brothers and sisters who are sincere Christians is that for one or another reason, they can only see one piece here and there, okay? God has privileged us. He's opened our eyes to see the whole thing, and we need to be bringing them into the whole framework. And what's going to enable us to do that with greater power is when our lives are a full reflection of this framework. The everlasting gospel, the whole picture. I just read, I just reread the story about the disciples bringing the man to Jesus and Jesus healed him progressively. He, he, he spat in his eyes and the man said, I see men as trees walking. That's how a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters are. They see men as trees walking. They see it, but they don't see it as clearly as they ought. That's our commission to give sight to the blind. Okay, so what, what is the heavenly ministry? Uh, we see also in the prophecies of Daniel. Uh, Daniel 7 verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. 
a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court or the judgment was seated and the books were open. Okay. The heavenly ministry of Christ includes this work of investigative judgment. And as far as the Bible is concerned, what Jesus did on earth and what Jesus is doing in heaven are equally as important. Okay. Theologians will try to tell you, oh, no, no, it's all about the cross. It's all about the cross. It's not true. Now, the cross is central, but it's not, all, it's, it's, it's not all comprehensive. The gospel includes everything that Jesus has done. And we'll do that more through the process of this series in our salvation. Everything he does for us, everything he does in us. We know this summary statement, Daniel 8, 14, the, the central pillar of our faith. What? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. This heavenly ministry of Christ in cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. This is the other side of the framework of the gospel. Everything about our existence exists in this framework. I put some other text uh, from the book of Revelation because if you have ever read the book of Revelation, you notice that all the visions of Revelation are punctuated by these scenes of the sanctuary. Did you know? I don't have time to unpack this. Don't worry, we will in future lessons. In Revelation, do you know Revelation literally follows Christ from the holy into the most holy and then back out of the most holy, back to this world? Literally. That's what Revelation is doing. It follows Jesus in his sanctuary ministry from the holy place to the most holy place Amen. Amen. back out of the most holy place to close a probation to come to this earth as conquering king right that's the heavenly ministry brothers and sisters think about it the everlasting gospel why do you think most christians reject the book of revelation why do you think they say it can't be understood because they can't see it they see ministries walking because they reject the sanctuary truth they literally cannot understand revelation now Please, nobody be confused. I'm not saying this to demean uh, Christians of other denominations. I'm just trying to help you to understand what God is calling you to be. Amen. And not to, not to be scared and ashamed of your message and your identity, but to embrace it and to realize that God has people in Babylon who need your help. God has people who are still living in the realm of Persia He's calling you to be Ezra, to be Nehemiah, to stand up and say, no, we need to get back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Amen? Amen. So I want to close by, I want to close by, 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 by just sharing with you this. What did Jesus teach about the judgment? A lot of people don't realize that Jesus' primary teaching on the judgment is his primary teaching on salvation. John chapter 3, Jesus is in a conversation with Nicodemus. And what does Jesus tell Nicodemus? He tells him, you must be born again. And he explains the truth of the new birth. That our title to enter God's heavenly kingdom is based on the Holy Spirit's work of changing our hearts, which can be likened to be born all over again. Amen? How does that happen? Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That change in our lives that fits us to enter the kingdom of heaven happens as we behold the love of God in the cross of Christ. And flowing directly out of that explanation, Jesus, Jesus walks directly from the truth about salvation to the truth of judgment so seamlessly. Why? Because Jesus saw no separation. For Jesus, judgment is a part of the gospel. Uh, what does Jesus teach about the judgment? John chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, and I'm reading it to you from this translation specifically because they catch a very important uh, nuance here. Um, John chapter 3, verse 18 to 21, this is a Christian standard Bible. I'll show you why I'm reading it in this translation. Um, anyone who believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now, what does he say? This is the judgment. He tells us. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Why do people reject truth? Is it because they can't understand it? No. 
Jesus says people reject truth. Why? Because their deeds are evil. That's why the gospel repent. Verse 20, for every does evil the light and avoids it so that his deeds may be exposed. Brothers and sisters, please understand this. When you have other people who are attacking us, or attacking our faith and calling us heretical and occult because we believe in investigative judgment, it's not because they don't understand prophecy. It has, it has nothing to do with Ellen White. It has everything to do. A person who is not truly born again will always reject the truth of God's judgment. I want to read that verse to you again. So, you know, I'm not saying that. For everyone who what? Who does evil. Everyone who wants to say the gospel is going to cover me in my sin. God is going to save me so I can keep on sinning as much as I want with no guilt. When I was a young man in college, that was the gospel that was being preached to me every Sunday. And it bothered me, man. And it should bother you. And guess what? Guess what? I know now that for all of God's true people who are in Babylon, it bothers them too. And that's why we need to preach boldly, because when they hear what we have to say, it makes them happy. If a person is a true follower of God, they will rejoice when they hear this present truth. I was being taught every week, oh, don't worry. God loves you. He saved you. It's all about his grace. So, so you can keep on sinning. You can just keep on sinning. Don't worry. You shouldn't have any guilt, right? You believe in Jesus, right? But at my life, I, my, my life was in shambles. Mercy. Because here's the reality. I don't care how much you try to explain it away. Sin hurts. It hurts yes. you and it hurts others. Okay? Yeah. That's why we need to be overcoming sin. Because I'm telling you right now, you may not realize it. Or maybe you do realize it. And I want to encourage the person who does realize it. If you're living in sin, if we're living in unrepented, unforsaken sin in our homes, you're hurting your family. You're hurting your family. Everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Now, what about the person who is born again? Look at verse 21. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light. Anyone who lives by the truth, they come to the light. They accept God's judgment. They embrace God's judgment. Why? So that his works may be shown to be accomplished by who? By God. When a person is truly saved, when a person is truly born again, they want to be examined by God because they know that all you're going to see is the goodness and the grace and the power of God. Because we're, we're, we, we, you, you, you're just like Paul. When I am weak, he is strong. For his strength is made perfect in weakness. The problem, the reason people get so fearful and they run away from this doctrine is because we don't have that experience. There hasn't been a surrender of our heart and soul so we can honestly say that I am dead and Christ lives in me. Let me ask you this. this, this, this can you just make it plain? I heard, I heard a brother on YouTube making it plain this weekend. If you are really dead to yourself and Christ is living in you, is he going to sin? Is Jesus going to sin? No. 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 If you are really dead and Jesus is living inside of you, are you afraid for Jesus to be examined in the judgment? No. 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 The problem is what? We are still very much alive and we're calling ourselves Christians. And that's why we run away from this. That's why we don't embrace this. Because we know that if we stand, if there is any remnant of self that stands before God, yeah, it's going to be condemned. But when we are dead and Jesus is living, God delights to see the perfect reflection of his only son in us. Amen. Amen. So, so, so let, me just draw, let me just draw these points out. Our standing in the judgment is based on how we respond to the light that God sends to us. Right? Light has come. Men love darkness rather than light. Those who are not born again run from the judgment because they are afraid of their evil deeds being exposed. Those who are born again embrace judgment because they are confident in the work that God has done in their life. Our standing in the judgment is not based on what we do as much as what we allow God to do in us through his Holy Spirit. That's why he says you must be what? Born again. Say it like this. In order to pass God's judgment, we must be born again. 
To be born again means to behold the love of God in Jesus Christ and for the heart to be changed from rebellion to loyalty. That is, when God's love leads you to faith, that is to say yes to God, yes to his will and to his way, the Holy Spirit writes the law of God on the heart. The heart is changed from rebellion to loyalty. This happens when we contemplate the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the greatest demonstration of God's unchanging love for each of us personally. You and I would do well to spend significant time each day meditating on the life of Jesus, tracing his footsteps scene by scene, especially the closing moments leading up to his death. The love of God displayed in Jesus Christ will awaken love in your cold, sinful heart. You will be led. If you don't resist, if you don't resist, if you just say yes to God. If you stop saying to God, you will be led to the foot of the cross in full surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. That's, that's all I have for the teaching portion tonight. And I want to take this time to open the floor for uh, questions and uh, comments. Hi. Hi there. Hello. I just want to thank you for the message. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I really am grateful for this message. This was amazing. And Amen. so, so needed. Amen. And again, I'll just say this again. Uh, we're laying this doctrinal foundation because my experience um, as being an Adventist is that when we talk about the investigative judgment, we talk more about the prophetic side of it. And I don't think we clarify enough how this connects to the gospel. That's just what I've heard. And you may have heard differently. Amen. I, I, Amen. Know, I, I know a few precious ministers a few precious ministers who God sent into my life to make this link so clear. And I'll be honest, as an Adventist, I just told you, I'm celebrating my seventh Advent, my seventh, seventh day Adventist birthday, seven years. I have really never had a struggle of feeling that Adventists are legalistic or that I, you know, I've never had a fear of the judgment. It wasn't until I went to school, I went to Southern University and I would, I would start explaining these truths to people and people would, I, I met a young lady who started crying because she was that scared. The, the judgment had been so misrepresented to her mind that wow. she couldn't accept the precious good news of Christ, of Christ's power to cleanse her from sin if she would only surrender to him. She, and and she, had, she needed a lot of help and time to come around to that, okay? So, so that's, that's why we're laying this doctrinal foundation. Yes, we could go much deeper into the prophecies of Daniel and into the day of atonement in Leviticus and to the sanctuary services as explained in Hebrews. But this, this core of the gospel I, I, I am finding is what really we need to spend more time dwelling on because that's, as we get practical in this, you'll see this is what's going to actually settle us into this thing. So we can actually start reflecting the image of Christ in the home and every, yeah. but especially the home. I'm impressed. Amen. I'm impressed. I'm impressed uh, with the fact that the Ten Commandments that the Adventists have and have always had, uh, you brought it out today, and the whole persons, all who would expect to be saved, must keep those Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. And I was impressed with that, uh, the way you brought that this evening. Uh, the, the leading back to Babylon or being prepared for Christ's coming and receiving eternal life. Right now, the judgment began in 1844, and it's going on right now, very near the end. And I'm impressed. I'm 92 years old. I started about this message when I was 21. So that's a long time. But I've been hearing about this. I'm, I'm going to impress that, uh, that this particular message, uh, Satan has gained a march fully right now, very strongly. And the majority, what is the sense you might have that the sense is very few actually believe that they ought to keep the Ten Commandments. Very few. Very few. Keep that in mind. But the only way that we will receive occupants and the earth may do that Christ is going to prepare, we will have to have proven 
and have kept the Ten Commandments. I'm praying after your prayers. I seek the sealing because we need to have the sealing to go through the last days. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to say, I want to say this. Um, a lot of a lot of people are confused on this. Um, they say, oh, well, what about people who are in ignorance? Now, God knows the heart of all men. Um, but before, okay, here's the thing. Historically, before God resurrected the truth about his Sabbath, I would have had more confidence about people being, uh, people being saved in their sincerity, not acknowledging the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, we've been living in this hour of God's judgment so long. Uh, in other words, if you're wise, when you talk about your family members and your loved ones who don't acknowledge uh, the, the, the commandments of God, and obviously the controverted commandment is the Sabbath, it's not wise to take a chance saying, oh, well, I think they're sincere. We live in a, we live in a time where it's not wise to make that assumption because God has, made this, God has made this truth about his holy day known for a long time now, okay? And uh, actually, the Bible teaches us that the, um, the hour of God's judgment actually takes away our excuses for ignorance. Let me share this with you just to give you something to contemplate because my brother said something very important. We do have to keep God's commandments. We have to keep God's commandments. Um, Acts chapter 17, uh, a lot of people don't emphasize this because you even hear a lot of Adventist ministers making the excuse, oh, well, no, God winks at ignorance. You need to read that, you need to read that entire text for yourself. Amen. That, Amen. That, that entire text Amen. says this. That is, that, that entire no. text says this, um, Acts chapter 17, okay? Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Now listen to it very clearly. Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. The hour of God's judgment takes away the excuse of ignorance. Amen. And that's ignorance of the Sabbath. That's ignorance of the dress reform, ignorance of the health reform, all this stuff that we say, oh, I just don't. Let me, let me read it to you. Don't take it from me. Acts chapter 17 Verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, therefore, having overlooked, notice that's past tense, first of all, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, okay? He has overlooked the times of ignorance, and why? What does he say next? Because, okay. verse 31, he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Okay, so why, when, when does the excuse of ignorance fall um, out of validity? It says, when you recognize that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world. And guess what? Through Daniel 8 and verse 14 and Revelation 14, 7, we know what is the time that God fixed for judgment? unto 2,300 days, then right. shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Thank you for bringing Amen. it up. I just, yes. I just wanted to speak to that. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Uh, there's one question I'd like to ask, Pastor. I, I, think yes, you sir. Covered it, I think you covered it repeatedly, but I just want to make it a bit more clear. Who does the judgment and when does the judgment end? When we did. Who does the judgment? Okay. Yes. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse 22 says that all judgment has been com committed to the Son, okay? Jesus Amen. Christ is the judge. Um, and, and, and here's what you have to understand about um, the, the, uh -oh, the, the legal, the, can you guys hear me? Amen. Okay. Yes. My, yes. My, computer, my computer is giving me a warning message saying, but praise God, it seems to be good. Um, the, the, the legal system uh, of the times of the Bible is not exactly the same, but you see Daniel chapter seven, you see the father seated upon the throne and Jesus appears before him. Now your, your second question, when does the judgment end? Yes. As in, as in yes, when, does, when does probation close? Yes, pastor. Okay. Okay. I didn't get into that subject this evening, but in, but in short, uh, probation, probation will close when the final test has come to every person living on this earth, okay? Uh, there is a time when the investigative judgment will pass from the cases of those who are dead to those who are living, okay? That's why Revelation 14 and verse 13 records these words. Revelation 14 verse 13 says it like this. The Bible says... Uh, blessed, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead 
who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. Okay? Uh, so a, a person who dies in Christ is blessed because they are spared in the sense that they're spared from that final crisis. The, 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 the mark of the beast, the National Sunday Law Crisis, marks the point in time. Now, we don't have a, I don't have a date, and nobody does, to give you of when that will happen, but the mark of the beast crisis will mark when the investigative judgment has passed from the dead to the living. Actually, we're going to get into that in a future message. So, 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 so definitely keep on coming. We're going to explain the connection between the test and the investigation, okay? We're really just, we're just getting started. Um, but that's, that's, that marks the beginning of the judgment of the living when that crisis comes. Of course, those who are going to give account in that judgment first are who? The people who already have light on that subject, Seventh-day Adventists, okay? Because we have light. We're going to make a decision on that, and our decision is going to seal our case in the judgment, whether we remain loyal to God and his commandments or whether we give in to Amen. the powers that be. That's why Amen. I'm talking uh, uh, that's why you and I need to know, brothers, and we're going to get into that. I don't want to, I don't want to preempt myself too much. And uh, this is a lot of what Sister Sandra is talking about that the Lord has been bringing out through uh, some of our studies is that God is preparing us right now Amen. because all the, all the knowledge of prophecy, all the knowledge of what's happening in the Vatican will not prepare you to stand if you have not learned what it means to live continually before God with a surrendered heart, okay? Amen. I, I, don't, I don't care how much you grasp these, these points and how much you can spell these things out. I'm not belittling that. I'm not saying you should not study both uh, history, prophecy, and current events. I'm not saying you should not, but I'm just saying, if we want that to be real, we must learn what it means to be so settled into this truth intellectually and spiritually so that we cannot be moved um so the judgment will end when that test has gone to uh to to every man that's why and by the way that's why jesus says uh jesus says um and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and what then the end will come probation will close when every individual has had a chance to hear the everlasting gospel and to make a decision for themselves right? Because when that National Sunday Law comes, the majority of people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church now will be shaken out. There will be a mighty Amen. shaking and sifting. Amen. The, Amen. The, 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 the remnant of loyal believers that actually remain in the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, will be sealed and fitted to, to give the loud cry. The gospel is going to go through this earth like a wildfire. Men and women are going to be converted for for all those majority that forsook the truth they're going to be an equal number of people from outside brought in and god's, fi god's final number his 144,000 i'm not saying literal or symbolic but his final remnant Amen. will be made up and uh prepared to stand during the time of jacob's trouble so that was a very little sweeping but that's that's when the judgment ends okay when when the test has come to every Amen. man and when the gospel has come to every man and they've made their decision. That's, that's what that's about. Amen. I appreciate, I it. I appreciate it, Pastor. So, yes, Pastor, Pastor Larry. Larry. Thank you for, so for sharing. Today. Sorry. I wanted to ask a question around a comment you made and wanted to get uh, your, your biblical understanding of this phrase you had mentioned that the only obedience that god recognizes is perfect obedience oh yes and yes. i can't agree with that more and wanted to you to uh for the sake of our audience uh provide us with uh, your biblical understanding of quote unquote perfect obedience because as you well know the word perfect scares uh, a lot of people, and I think that if we have clarity around uh, the term, I think it will help us be a lot more comfortable accepting that uh, very true statement that you made earlier. Okay, yes. Um, yes, the only, the only obedience that God can accept is perfect obedience. Um, 
my biblical foundation for that, uh, I could give you several points. Actually, I will give you several points. Uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Actually, let's, 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 do, it this, let's do it this way. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Jesus told the people in no uncertain language, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. He said, for I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, okay? They had to have a righteousness that exceeded that which they had grown accustomed to. And in Matthew 5 and verse 48, he explains what is that righteousness that surpasses. He, in Matthew 5 and verse 48, he says, therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And I always tell people, if the Bible uses that word, don't be scared of that word. Don't be scared of that word. Ask God what he means by that word and, and, and trust that God is going to do that in you. Uh, my other biblical validation for that statement I made is simply here in James chapter 2 and verse 10. James chapter 2 and verse 10, uh, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. So either you're keeping the whole law or you're not keeping any of the law. Okay, that's, that's the Bible's stance. Verse 11 says, for he who has said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. In, in other words, no matter what point of the commandments you're violating, you're sinning against the same God. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And the encouragement that James gives, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. And you, and, and you said this, Elder Larry, which is so true that we uh, become afraid when we hear that word perfect. And I will say again, you should be afraid, okay? In the sense that uh, you shouldn't hear that and think, oh, I can do that. that. That was Israel's problem in the old covenant. They just came up to God and said, oh, all that you said, we will do. It's like, you don't really have a concept of the holiness of God if, if, you, if you see his law and you recognize his holiness and say, all right, all right, God, I got that. I can handle that. Ten commandments. All right, let's, we, we got this. Don't worry, God. I'll, I'll report back to you and let you know how it's going. That is, that is foolishness, okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it should, the idea of standing before a perfect God should frighten you. And, and what we must understand is that that explains to us this biblical teaching that we must be dead, okay? We must be dead and Christ must live within. Amen. That is, the, that is the Bible's way of saying, that's Galatians 2 and verse 20, Galatians 2 and verse 20, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me and the life I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You, you see, you have to understand righteousness is not trying to do the right thing. Righteousness is so surrendering your heart and will unto God that he has full and absolute sway over your life. Amen. Amen. That's what I was looking for, Esther. Yes, Amen. that's the statement. That's the statement. Amen. Okay. Amen. I, I, figured, I figured you wanted me to get there, um, and I'm glad I got there. And, and that's the experience that we must be seeking for. Uh, I was working with the young people at camp meeting this year, the juniors. I love the fact that God lets me get them while they're young, and I can start putting these seeds in so they can start asking their, their parents questions like, why are we eating chicken? Um, and things. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. Uh, anyways, I'm saying... Um, uh, 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 I was working with the young people and we were going over the Beatitudes of Christ. And, you know, the first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. And, and, the, and the young people, ages 10 to 13, their minds were grasping this concept that there can be no poverty of spirit without a correct conception of God's judgment. Right. And, and that's why that's why the first angel's message emphasizes the true effects of the gospel. If you really believe the gospel, you're going to fear God. OK, you should fear God. And we don't emphasize that enough. Now, of course, we're not talking about an abject terror, but it's something to respect God in his holiness and his power and his authority. OK, um, 
And Amen. when you know the gospel, in, in other words, how can you really be poor in spirit if you don't understand that when you stand before God's judgment seat in yourself, apart from Jesus, you deserve nothing but wrath. Amen. Amen. And, so, and so do you see how Satan is doing this? Yep. By getting the majority of the Christian world to reject the, the truth of God's investigative judgment that we have to actually stand before God, he's creating, has created generation after generation of Christians who have no concept of what it means to be poor in spirit. Why do you, why do you think people would bring a rock band into a church? Yeah. I was just reading, I was just, I was just, I was just reading a story yesterday and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be lewd or explicit. I was just reading a story yesterday about a, a church that had a lady come and preach a sermon through an exotic dance. Whoa. Yeah, I've seen that. Why, 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 why do you think people can stand up in churches and shout and holler and clap and dance and spin around and do backflips on a stage? Why, yes. why do you think? It's because they, they have no concept. The fear of God is not before their eyes. And this, is, this has been Satan's calculated work. And he does it through these falsehoods. I better stop talking. I, I'm supposed to be leaving you guys time to give comments. Praise the I'm Lord. Sorry, but, Praise yeah, the Lord. What I'm saying. Pastor. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Pastor, you hearing me? Yes. Yes, sir. In the response that you gave pertaining to the judgment, should we not make a distinction between the investigative judgment as opposed to the judgment of the wicked according to what the servant of God tells us in Great Controversy 480? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, that, is a, that is another Seventh-day Adventist distinctive is that we recognize the different phases of God's judgment, namely the investigative judgment and uh, you could say the executive judgment but then you have that uh when, when christ actually comes and executes judgment but then you have that period of time uh spoken of in revelation chapter 20 called the millennium where the saints reign with christ in heaven a thousand years uh where the wicked are judged in this sense uh, as jesus said very clearly the person that believes not on christ is condemned already okay so uh, God is going to give his saints during the millennium, he's going to give us the privilege of presiding with him in judgment and essentially just confirming the confirmation of the wicked and, uh, and, and agreeing, Amen. agreeing with Amen. him that his judgment is So what about judgment. the Amen. determination as to what Ellen White speaks? I can't pull the right phrase that they're going to be making a determination as to the appropriate punishment that because each person is not going to receive the same punishment. Right, right. They're going to be punished according to our deeds. What about that phase of which the angels are going to go, not the angels, but the saints along with Christ are going to be making that determination? Um, <laughs> yes, that, that is, let me, since I'll, I'll, I'll just bring out, I'll bring out a biblical foundation for that. I don't, now you have to forgive me, I don't have a spirit of prophecy reference on the top of my head, but I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, I, I know this biblical text. Let me see here. Let's see. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world. If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the matters of this life? Yes, so yes, you are right. We will play a part in determining. Well, okay, because obviously we understand that the wicked are not, are not burned in hell eternally, right? That right. They, are, they are terminated in the flames of hell different people will burn uh, for different periods of time according as their sins are, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a part in making that determination. Yes, thank you for bringing out that specification. And so yes, we should make a distinction between the investigative judgment that is taking place now, where only the names are being considered of those who profess loyalty to Christ, right? That's, the, that's what is meant, First Peter 4 verse 17, 
it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. Okay? Amen. Correct. I have a question. Yes, Sister Paris, yes. When, see, I agree with that. Even that I don't totally understand everything quite yet since, I mean, I'm a young Adventist as well, but some things make sense just from the fact that they make sense. You can't ask God to, to, to do things for you if you say, you know, God, I want you to do this and that. So you have to give you, your will to him because he knows what's best. Amen. Now, saying that is uh, because I truly believe that. But say for someone like myself, I, I came from different denominations, born a Jew. Um, when you learn that, that, and you say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, that um, the the judgment ends when on each individual when they die. That's when their judgment is done. I mean, their 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 bed is made, they're finished, and they're done. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yes. Or is there, is there uh, difference? Yes, there is. Uh, if I am I, if I'm understanding what you're asking correctly. You're, you're saying that when a person dies, their probation closes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's put it this way. Um, there are different ways in which our probation will close, can close. There are, everybody look at my hand, three ways that a person can close their probation. Three ways. Number one is to die. Number one is to die. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. Because why? After you're dead, there are no more decisions. Okay? Right. That's the point that Jesus was teaching in the rich man and Lazarus. You right. must make your choices in this life, and that's why we must choose Jesus to trust and obey him. Secondly, a person can close their probation by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Right? Amen. That because it, you, yeah. So you can, you can close probation on yourself while you're still alive. Yeah. That's, a, that's, right. a fear, that's a fearful truth right there. That's why we must pray and ask God to keep our hearts soft before him. Um, because you can blaspheme the spirit in this life. And that is the sin that will not be forgiven, neither Pastor. in this age or in the age to come. Yes. Pastor. So, hi, I have a question. Oh, hey, Sister that. Maxine. He's hi, not Pastor. Done. Hi. hi he's not done? No, he's not done with the answer. The first, the, I, okay. I didn't get the first the All right. last one. Please go oh, ahead okay. and then yes, I'll sorry. ask uh, mine. Because, yes, th go three, ahead. Three, three ways, three ways to die, to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and number three, is to come up to this final crisis. You can, your probation, if your probation is not already closed, your probation will be closed by the final market abuse crisis. That's the, that's the third way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That okay. makes sense. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad that made sense. Amen. Yes, yeah, Sister Maxine. So good evening, everybody on the forum. Um, so I'm not sure, but could you please explain to us or me how you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because oh, wow. my understanding of that is when you constantly or all your life, you, because the Holy, the, the Bible says that he has placed his laws into our hearts. And so, so we have a conscience as to what God wants us to do, right? And yeah. so the Holy Spirit that Jesus left us with after he left earth is what's going to be working on our hearts to convict us. Mm. This is my understanding of it. And so as we go along every day, the Holy Spirit is acting on our hearts, trying to convict our hearts. And we, like I did all of my life up until um, 2012 when I accepted him as my personal savior from sin. So, if I had continued this, this process of rejecting him constantly, knowing, knowing that he's there, knowing that he's, he's pricking my conscience, knowing that he's working on my heart, and I continue to do this until upon my death, that is how I would be blaspheming the Holy Spirit because this is Jesus in the spirit acting on my heart. This is God's gift Amen. to me. So this is how I understood it. So if this, so could you please, because you said it's three different ones. So if, um, 
if my uh, my if how I understood it would was right, then it would, as far as I'm concerned, would be only one way that you you know. But could you please um explain how we we blaspheme the Holy Spirit because that is okay. contrary to how I believe it. Um, I, the way the way you just explained it, I thought was I thought was spot on. That's that's what it is to resist the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit is to blaspheme Him, right. and uh, when He is convicting you of your sin, and when He's convicting you of the righteousness of Christ, and convicting you of the judgment of the devil, if if you're resisting that, and uh, if you're refusing to repent of sin, refusing to turn to Christ, if you're refusing obedience, that's that's how you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And we are told in Genesis chapter 6 that the, the Spirit of God will not wrestle or will not strive with men forever. Um, so I, I think that, um, I, I think what you may be asking, okay, there are many ways to blaspheme the Spirit. And you're kind of you're confirming a conviction that I had. I've been convicted that I need to do an entire series on the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So we understand how, re how serious that is. Um, but what, what I was talking to Paris about was the close of probation. I'm saying that your probation closes when you die, but you can also close probation on yourself in this life by blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sister Maxine, is that, is that, does that make sense that it's... Not really, because, because, okay. um, we, because if... <laughs> I would, because I thought that it was just, okay, so this is also the unpardonable sin, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. This is the one way. Okay, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think I'm quite understanding your question. Maybe someone else is understanding uh, better what you're asking. And can yeah, I, I think Sister Maxine is, um, in all due respect, Sister Maxine, I think you're uh, not making the, stink, the, the, the distinction between blaspheming the Holy Ghost and the close of probation. Okay. They're totally different things. Okay. And all Pastor Burrell is saying that one of the ways that you close probation is by blaspheming the Holy Ghost. But there are other ways that probation can close on an individual, such as death. He agrees wholeheartedly with your understanding uh, and your description of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. He's just simply articulating that there is more than one way of uh, for the probation for probation to close on us. I don't know if that helps or not. Does that 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 made sense to me? Does that make sense to you, Sister Maxine? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, okay. How how about this? Uh, now, now that I how about this? Now that I heard Elder Larry say that, uh, w what if I say this? Does this? Thank make you, sense? Brother Larry. Thank you, Elder Larry, because that, that that was very that was very clear for me. Um, how about this? If you okay, if you make it through this whole life and if you die without receiving Christ, you did blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Does yes. that make sense? Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you so yeah so so yeah dying without receiving Christ because I believe. That, that Christ reveals himself to every person, that, that there's, not, there's not one person that's going to stand before God in judgment and say, oh, I, you never showed yourself to me. No such thing. The Bible, the Bible tells us that um, even the heavens declare the glory of God. So yeah, okay. So, okay, good. That makes sense. Yeah. If you die without receiving Jesus, you did blaspheme the Holy Ghost, right? Okay. 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 I think, okay. Thank you. I think that that was the... Um, um, the hold up. Amen. Well, it is a thank you, Sister. Uh, thank you, Sister Max. I'm it's, glad you're here. Sister Sandra, what is the word? It's 8 p.m. Uh, we've been here for a good long time, and I just want to respect everybody's boundaries. Yes, let us close, please. Amen. So you can offer us the closing prayer, and next week we will be back here at the same time, 6 p.m., and uh, the Lord will bless again. Hallelujah. Amen. Next week, uh, get ready. We talked today. We talked about the framework of the gospel. Next week, we're going to be talking about the background of the gospel. Amen. I'm excited for that. Let's pray right now. And I invite you to pray with me. I'll pray out loud, but uh, don't neglect to pray for yourself right now. Father in heaven, 
Uh, we thank you for the Sabbath hours, these Sabbath hours that stretch late into the night during this time of year. Uh, we thank you for these mighty truths you have revealed to your people. Lord, I pray that these mighty, weighty, sobering truths will humble us. Number one, to place ourselves in a right position before you through the surrender of our will. Secondly, to place ourselves in the right position towards our brethren in this world through aggressive mission and service. But thirdly, Lord, I pray that this doctrinal foundation, I'm asking your Holy Spirit, Lord, your Holy Spirit is the true master builder. I'm praying that understanding this mighty truth will ultimately lead us to place ourselves in the right position in our home. Lord, so often we disconnect theory from practice. We disconnect doctrine from experience, but we need your Holy Spirit to make that connection between our head and our hearts just now. Help us to realize that, we're, that we are saved through the mercy and compassion of, of, of Jesus Christ alone that you have displayed, but that when we are saved, our lives will be radically transformed and brought into full conformity with your will. Lord, that truth has become so plain to me and I know your Holy Spirit will make it plain to all who are willing to receive it. Lord, I pray that you would inspire and convict the hearts of, of people to take this opportunity to actually study into this for themselves, to let these truths really sink in and not just be a, a Saturday evening Bible study that, that, that goes in one ear and, and out of the other, but that it truly may become some bedrock principles of our heart and life that we understand, that we live out, but that we can also clearly articulate to others. We thank you, Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We praise you. We give you honor and glory. Lord, we ask that you prepare us to receive your seal on our forehead, that you prepare us to be recipients of the latter rain and givers of the loud cry. Lord, we desire to be a part of this work. We're not worthy but we're trusting in Jesus to make us worthy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.